Designing a successful information system requires integrating people, software, and hardware. To achieve this integration, designers often follow the system's development life cycle known as the SDLC, also known as the waterfall model. It's a series of well-defined phases performed in sequence that serves as a framework for developing a system or a project. Here's the SDLC. It starts with planning, moves to requirements and analysis, then design, implementation, and finally maintenance. Systems planning today is about elevating all potential systems that need to be improved. Information system projects are often an extension of existing systems or involve replacing an old technology with a new one. For existing information systems, some phases might not be applicable, although the SDLC model can still be used. The planning phase is one of the most critical phases of the SDLC model. Problem can be identified internally or externally. Here's some questions to ask. Why is the information system being developed? Who are the system's current and future users? Is the system new or is it an upgrade or extension of an existing system and which functional areas will be using the system? Establishing evaluation criteria ensures objectivity throughout the SDLC process. Analysts must get feedback from users on the problem and the need for an information system. The end result of this phase will give users and top management a clear view of what the problem is and how the information system will solve the problem. To ensure an information system's success, users must have input in the planning, requirements gathering and analysis, design and implementation phases. System designers and analysts should explain the goals and benefits of the new system so that the task force knows what to look for in user input. Internal users are employees who will use the system regularly, and they can offer important feedback on the system's strengths and weaknesses. External users are not employees, but do use the system. They include customers, contractors, suppliers, and other business partners. Although external users are not normally part of a task force, their input is essential. Using a task force for designing an information system is similar to using the joint application design approach. Feasibility is the measure of how beneficial or practical an information system will be to an organization. It should be measured continuously and throughout the SDLC process. During the planning phase, analysts investigate a proposed solution's feasibility and determine how to best present the solution to management in order to obtain funding. To conduct an economic feasibility study, the systems analyst team must identify all costs and benefits, tangible and intangible, of the proposed system. Opportunity costs measure what you would miss by not having a system or feature. Technical feasibility is concerned with the technology that would be used in the system. Operational feasibility is the measure of how well the proposed solution will work in the organization and how internal and external customers will react to it. Scheduling feasibility is concerned with whether the new system can be completed on time. Legal feasibility is concerned with legal issues. In the requirements gathering and analysis phase, analysts define the problem and generate alternatives for solving it. During this phase, the team attempts to understand the requirements for the system, analyzes these requirements to determine the main problem, and looks for ways to solve problems by designing the new system. The first step in the phase is gathering requirements. Several techniques are available for these steps, including interviews, surveys, and observations. All of this information can be recorded, and the team uses the information to determine what the new system should do, process analysis, and what data is needed for the process to be performed, data analysis. A document can then be sent to key users and task force members for approval summarizing these items. 
The creation of this document indicates the end of the analysis phase and the start of the design phase. There are two major approaches to the analysis and design of information systems. The Structured Systems Analysis and Design, or SSAD approach, and the Object-Oriented approach. These two approaches use different tools for creating analysis models. Models created during the analysis phase constitute the design specifications. During the design phase, analysts choose the solution that is the most realistic and offers the highest payoff for the organization. For large projects in particular, computer-aided systems engineering tools are helpful in the analysis and the design phases. The design phase consists of three parts, conceptual, logical, and physical design. The conceptual design is an overview of the system and does not include hardware or software choices. The logical design makes the conceptual design more specific by indicating hardware and software. These choices usually require changing the conceptual design to fit the platforms and programming language chosen. Finally, the physical design is created for a specific platform. Systems analysts use case or computer-aided engineering systems tools that automate parts of the application development process. These tools are particularly helpful for investigation and analysis in large-scale projects because they automate parts of the design phase. Prototyping has been around for many years in physical science because building a small working model first is easier and less expensive than building the entire system. Prototyping has gained popularity in designing information systems because needs can change quickly and a lack of specifications for the system can be a problem. Numerous tools can be used for constructing a system prototype. Case tools and third and fourth generation programming language can be used to quickly develop prototypes. During the implementation phase, the solution is transferred from paper to action, and the team configures the system and procures components for it. Tasks include acquiring new equipment, hiring new employees, training them, and planning and designing the system's physical layout. When an information system is ready to be converted, designers have several options. In parallel conversion, the old and new systems run simultaneously for a short time to ensure the new system works correctly. Phased in, phased out conversion, each module of a new system is converted and the corresponding part of the old system is retired. In a plunge, direct cutover conversion, the old system is stopped and the new system is implemented. Pilot conversion, the ana analyst introduces the system in only a limited area of the organization, such as a division or a department. IT project management includes activities required to plan, manage, and control the creation and delivery of an information system. Request for Proposal, RFP, is a written document with detailed specifications that is used to request bids for equipment, supplies, or services from vendors. A critical part of the process is comparing bids from single and multiple vendors. The main advantage of an RFP is that all vendors get the same information and requirements so bids can be evaluated more fairly. A major disadvantage of an RFP is the time involved in writing and evaluating proposals. Given the time needed to complete information system projects as quickly as possible, shortening the time needed to write and evaluate proposals is often necessary. The SDLC approach is sometimes called insourcing, meaning an organization's team develops the system internally. Self-sourcing is when end users develop their own information systems with little or no formal assistance from the information systems team. With the outsourcing approach, an organization hires an external vendor or consultant who specializes in providing developmental services. 
Crowdsourcing refers to the process of outsourcing tasks that are traditionally performed by employees or contractors to a large group of people, a crowd, through an open call. However, it has some disadvantages as well, so you should be careful about crowdsourcing in your SDLC planning. There are several important steps in the maintenance phase. The maintenance team assesses how the system is working and takes steps to keep the system up and running. If the system's objectives are not being met, the team must take corrective action. With the ongoing nature of the SDLC approach, maintenance can lead to starting the cycle over at the planning phase if the team discovers the system is not working correctly. Creating a help desk to support users is another important task in the maintenance phase. The SDLC model might not be appropriate in the following situations. Well, there's a lack of specifications, that is, the problem under investigation is not well defined. Where the input-output process cannot be identified completely. Where the problem is ad hoc, meaning it's a one-time problem that is not likely to reoccur. And where users' needs keep changing, which means the system undergoes several changes. For these situations, other approaches described in the following sections are more suitable. An SOA attempts to solve software development issues by reorganizing, accepting, and leveraging existing services. Checking shipping status, customer credit, or inventory status are a few examples of such services. The fundamental principle behind an SOA is that the blocks of code can be reused in a variety of different applications, allowing new business processes to be created from a pool of existing services. In any business organization, there are things that do not change very often, such as an order processing system. Many organizations use SOA as a philosophy and methodology. Rapid Application Development known as RAD, sometimes known as RAD, concentrates on user involvement and continuous interaction between users and designers. It combines the planning and analysis phases of the system's development life cycle into one phase and develops a prototype of the system. RAD uses an interactive process, also called incremental development, that repeats the design, development, and testing steps as needed based on feedback from users. It uses visual interfaces to allow IS personnel to drag various components from the software library, connect them in specific ways, and create an application with little or no coding required. After the initial prototype, the software library is reviewed, reusable components are selected from the library and integrated with the prototype, and testing is conducted. After these steps, the remaining phases are similar to the SDLC approach. One shortcoming of RAD is a narrow focus, which might limit future development. In addition, because these applications are built quickly, the quality might be lower. Extreme programming is a recent method for developing software applications and information system projects. XP divides the projects into smaller functions and developers cannot go to the next phase until the current phase is finished. Analysts write down features the proposed system should have called the story on index cards. Each function of the overall project is developed in a step-by-step -step fashion. In the XP environment, programmers are usually organized into teams of two, sharing a workstation and working on the same code. XP is a major departure from traditional software development, such as the SDLC model, which looks at the project as a whole. Like RAD, XP uses software libraries for reusable pieces that can be integrated into the new system. Agile methodology is similar to XP in focusing on an incremental development process and timely delivery of working software. 
Agile methodology focuses on setting a minimum number of requirements and turning them into a working product. The Agile Alliance organization has developed guidelines for this method, which emphasize collaboration between programmers and business experts, preferably with face-to-face -face communication and working teams. Goals of a step-by-step -step approach include responding to changing needs instead of sticking to a set plan and developing working, high-quality software. The Agile Alliance has written a manifesto that includes the following principles. Satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Welcome changing requirements even late in development. Have business people and developers work together daily throughout the project. Build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support that they need, and trust them to get the job done. Always attend to technical excellence. Good design enhances agility. At regular intervals, the team should reflect on how to become more effective, then tune and adjust its behavior accordingly.